Wouldn't we all want to travel the world and do great things? That's what our guest today did, John Newstrom, right here. John, I was so thrilled that you were coming on the show. I just had to ask you about these adventures of yours. Which one was the most fun, Alaska, Croatia, Afghanistan, or the Sudan? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, pretty much all of them in different ways. Uh, Afghanistan was probably the most difficult <coughs> just because of what was going on around me at the time. Hmm. Well, as we, as we get into these places, though, um, you could have had your choice of lots of places to go and lots of things to do because, you know, you're a broadcast professional. Um, why, why did you want to go to places like this? Well, there's, well, first off, there's money in it uh, in the sense of the... Uh, International media development is a, a thriving business, so uh, you're not going to Paris. They don't need it, mm -hmm. uh, but Afghanistan certainly needed it, and so it was very rewarding to do that too. One of the things that we were talking about right before the show started, though, was some early days of your early days of radio and working in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And actually, I thought that that was really kind of neat, uh, either whether it was Alaska or Minnesota, in the way that radio itself was relevant then. Is radio relevant now? Yes, uh, especially around the world. Radio is affordable. You just a, a few batteries. You can also surround a radio with people. My mother told me about listening to Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, mm -hmm. and the whole family was surrounding the radio. They didn't believe the hoax. They, they knew it was just a drama. But uh, that's what happens. In Africa, you'll find uh, 10, 15 people wrapped around a radio. And a television, it's a little harder to do. You can do it. There's a lot of cafes and such that will have a television set, and people will sit around and watch TV and drink tea or beer or whatever, depending on where they are. So, but radio is so much more accessible. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Radio was important, though, in Alaska. When Absolutely. You were there as well. Absolutely. Was it the same kind of community feel? Yes. In fact, uh, a story that happened in Petersburg when I lived there, it's just a small town in an island in the middle of nowhere. And uh, this woman got on the ferry um, to go to Ketchikan, and she was uh, nine months pregnant, and she's gonna have her baby in Ketchikan. Well, as the ferry left Petersburg, uh, her water broke. And so the ferry had to turn around and wrangle narrows, which is not a very good thing to do, but they managed to do it. Now the problem was they're coming back to Petersburg, but no one's expecting the ferry to come. So they couldn't find the guy that ties up the ferry. <laughs> so we put on the radio, hey, get down to the ferry terminal, the ferry's coming back, there's a emer medical emergency. So the whole town knew about this and they all went searching for the guy to tie up the ferry. So that kind of thing is really important in Alaska. Hmm. And it's important in Africa. We've, we had a lost child uh, in Juba, South Sudan that somebody brought by the station and we put the child on the air who said, mommy, come and get me. And we finally found his parents. And uh, so it's a rewarding thing all hmm. around. Radio is really important. Well, let's go to Croatia, um, sure. and you were there 1999 through 2002 or mm -hmm. thereabouts. It was basically right at the end of, the, of 10 years at least of wars in that area. Right, and the first place I lived was a place called Vukovar, which was flattened during the war, and my job was to help Serb radio stations get going in Croatia, and don't forget the Serbs and the Croats were the ones fighting. Yeah. So the, Serb having, the Serbs having a radio stations of their own was important to get the Serbs to resettle, come back home after the war. And if you have local culture that's familiar to you, you'll be more likely to come home. Yeah, but you're not local. I'm not, no, but they were. And so I was just helping them try to find ways to survive. What did you do? Help them with business planning. Uh, I found an a NGO there that taught business planning, and it was taught in Croatian and had a book written in Croatian. And then I had a, hired a Croatian assistant to help walk them through it. So some of them slept with their business plan under their pillows. And those radio stations are alive and kicking today, many years later. When you went into Croatia, did you get the opportunity to find out what the fighting was all about? <sighs> It was really difficult to do that. Uh, you, everyone wants to tell you their story, a long history of it, and there's some really, really sad stories. What struck me as odd was they wanted to go back to World War II. There were some untold stories that they weren't allowed to talk about uh, under Tito's regime. So they wanted to get that out because it just wasn't allowed to be spoken about. And World War II was 50 years gone. Yes, but that, that 
that's the root of what the difficulties were. Yugoslavia was forced together after World War II and they didn't necessarily like each other and part of Yugoslavia was more pro-Nazi and the other was pro-Allies. So there was a lot of animosity still spread around. And you started a radio station and all of that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what do they broadcast on radio uh, in Croatia that people will listen to at that point? Music. Just music. There's music. No, no, I mean, no there was there was talk shows. Uh -huh. A lot of it was uh, the way the radio stations could finance themselves. The UN, for example, was trying to transition out. So the UN would hire radio stations if they would do an hour-long program on what the efforts were to help people relocate and uh, access to community resources and that kind of thing. And they would pay the stations. And sometimes that was the only income the stations had because businesses were dead. Um, one radio station, in fact, made money by doing concerts. Uh, they would have local musician come up, they'd play on the air, and then when the station was ready to sign off, they'd say, hey, we're going over to this tavern, and if you want to hear some more music, come on and join us. Mm -hmm. And then they would take, at the end of the month, they'd do a concert and get all four musicians, you know, from the past four weeks, throw this concert and charge, like, you know, a dollar to get in. And that was enough to pay the salaries for a month. Wow. I can imagine local politicians would be just fine with concerts, but anything outside of uh, concerts or music, local politicians perhaps may not be so fond of free well, media. Well, in Croatia, as a matter of fact, most of the radio stations are political. They're owned by a party or owned by the mayor. And so when a new mayor comes along, they fire all the staff and put in his people into that station. So yeah, it's very, very political. How did you deal with that? Tried to find radio stations that were independent and willing to listen to everybody and anything, and then build, help them build on that, and really hold those ideas of independence, uh, which was also a challenge because we were funded by the U.S. government. So we often had to tell the U.S. government, wait a minute, we're building independent media. That means independent from the Croatian government, the local government, and the American government. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, and, and in getting ready for the show, I can just imagine the phone call. You'd say, uh, call up and say, Mom, I'm, I'm done with Croatia, and guess where I'm going next? <laughs> and your answer was Afghanistan. <sighs> yeah, well, my parents got kind of used to me bouncing around in various places. Afghanistan was a challenge. Uh, actually, I was in Seattle before I uh, went to Afghanistan, and I was having a hard time finding a job, and Afghanistan came up, so I took it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, in Afghanistan, it was, it was a little different, though. You were, yeah. you were actually in Kabul, and you were, um, were you an on-the-ground reporter, or what exactly no, I, were you I, doing? My title was Chief of Party, believe it or not. Chief uh, of Party? Chief of Party. Isn't that a great Fun title? Fun Party? The, the company I worked for was called Internews, and Internews was the party, and I was the head of Internews' activities in Afghanistan, so it's chief of party. Mm, I see. Anyway, it's kind of complicated, but uh, there well, we built radio stations across the country, and if you wanted to talk for a while, if you wanted to talk to Afghans, you had to come to us and the community radio stations we built, and we built them into a network. So each station was privately owned, some were for-profit, some were uh, non-profits, some were all women stations. And then we produced our own newscasts, uh, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and then each station broadcast that. Hmm. And then we sold, also sold advertising. So if it, you had an NGO that was vaccinating children, they had problems when these helicopters would land and people get off the helicopters and go grab children. And parents would, of course, hide their children yeah. Well, we would put on the air, hey, this is about vaccination, and here's why vaccinations are good. And we'd have a doctor, we'd have an imam from the local mosque, and talk about how vaccinations were good. So then what happened was the helicopters land, and people are bringing their babies to the helicopters. I got like a thousand questions right now, and so I, let me, let's see, I'll just start firing them off. Sure. Uh, the people, how would they accept you? I mean, you know, you don't look Afghani. I do, actually. Oh, do you? Uh, in fact, one of my escape plans, which is something you should always have, uh, was uh, put on a Camille Show East, kind of the pajamas looking thing. It's mm -hmm. a very long shirt and uh, very baggy pants. Uh, and if I wore a scarf, and especially if I put the scarf in my mouth, which mm -hmm. is their kind of habit, and sat on my heels, 
uh, you know, on the ground, um, I would look Afghan. Yeah. But if I spoke, game's over. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you have to have an exit plan? Always have an exit plan. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. Uh, in South Sudan, I had uh, I bought a car in Kenya, so I could drive around in in South Sudan. But I kept my Kenyan license plates, and that was part of my escape plan in case yeah. war broke out again. I could just put the Kenyan plates on my car and head to the Ugandan border and get through a little mm -hmm. easier. Well, it, when you were in Afghanistan, though, we can't say in case war broke out again because war was there. It was there, and it's still. And we also kept a, I kept a Pakistani visa always in my passport so that if I had to leave, I could at least get through without having the hassle of uh, waiting for a visa. You forgive me, is Pakistan safer than Afghanistan? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. There was also UN flights out, but it's always nice to have more than one way of getting out if you had to. As far as Kabul, we have had people come on the show who would actually be critical of the media that said that you know, whenever <laughs> media came to town, they would stay in Kabul when the real action was outside. Is right. that, was that you? Uh, well, we, I didn't get out that much for security reasons mainly. Uh, if I could catch a flight with uh, other people who were going someplace, I would do that. But normally we wouldn't go out very often. But the project had 170 Afghans working for it. So mm -hmm. those guys got out all the time. Were they always on your side? Not always. Tell us about that. Uh, sometimes, one of the, one of the dangers of of doing broadcasting in a different country in different languages is not knowing what you're broadcasting. Uh, so uh, I was very careful. The Voice of America has learned this lesson repeatedly. You got to have somebody listening that knows the language that you trust to tell you what's happening. It happened to me in Alaska. Uh, we had a great show on a radio station, I guess I probably shouldn't say where, uh, that had a great program called Fiesta Filipiniana, and it was a group of Filipinos that came in and did this really great music show on a Friday night. And it was a really, really popular show, and it was all in Tagalog. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't speak Tagalog, you didn't know what was happening. Well, it turns out they were fundraising for the Marcoses. Oh. <laughs> they were raising money using our airwaves, but since nobody was listening to it that spoke Tagalog, we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So I learned my lesson and uh, tried to make sure that we uh, always know what's being broadcast, no matter what. All right, so if you, you, you're in Afghanistan, there's somebody who is saying something on the station that you are the chief of party over and saying something that he or she shouldn't say, probably a he. Um, what do you do? Well, we did it in advance. We tried to make sure we knew everything that was gonna go oh, on so the air beforehand. Uh, well, some parts were live, but the the people that were doing the live were like the anchors, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, so those people were trusted um, and did a good job. And, you know, we listened to them too. And we would talk to them afterwards if there were things that were off. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't trying to be um, the the guy with a whip, you know. And generally speaking, it's better to, if the Afghans police themselves. So there were people that were monitoring and were the, in charge of the, of the programs, and they obviously speak the language and they know the language. Mm -hmm. So they would catch things before they were broadcast. What did the Afghanis want out of a radio station? Afghanis the currencies, the Afghans are the people. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no, thank you very much for the education. Well, it's, it's easy to be confused. Um, anyway, um, what were they concerned about? They, were, they wanted a better life and they knew the broadcasting was part of it. Like uh, there was a woman on the staff uh, when women could get driver's licenses. She decided to do a, pr a program about her getting a driver's license. And so she recorded the entire process. Uh, unfortunately, when her first day out driving by herself, she also brought her recorder with her and she got this on tape, but she was hauled out of her car and beaten because women aren't supposed to drive. Well, I was going to ask you the question of, of how did women fare, and I guess you just answered it. Yeah, not good. They were very brave. We had a gender sensitivity training that we did that I would be asked to speak at the beginning and at the end at graduation, and it would bring me to tears every time. When I think about my mother and the, how the world changed for her, you know, the Leave it to Beaver generation to today, 
it, the role of women in the United States has changed. Well, here's women that are taking control of their own lives in Afghanistan. My HR officer was a woman who taught English from her home during the Taliban era. She could have been killed for that. Oh, absolutely. What was your relationship with the U.S. military? None. Uh, we were, again, the company I worked for was Internews. They had a board level policy to have nothing to do with the Department of Defense. Yeah. We also trained our staff that if you, if they were going out on a field trip and they saw a military convoy to make an immediate 90 degree turn, just get the heck out of the way. The military convoy is the target, not, not us. Yeah. Were you, did you ever feel like you were a target? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, in many places. Uh, How did you deal with it? You just kind of go with it. Um, in Afghanistan you know specifically. I'm not sure that I, under, that I understand. Well, you go with it, you're a target. You know, hey, here I am. Well, okay, in Juba, South Sudan, the military drives around in trucks and they're all carrying AK-47s and they have fun pointing their AK-47s at you, especially if you're a white person. So there's not much you can do about it. You just kind of go along with it. Uh, okay, there, no one that I know of has been shot, but it's possible. And you, so you don't know what to do with it. In Afghanistan, what we did is we went to the local mosque and we worked with the mosque and the imam in the mosque and did things for the community, like go pick up garbage or we fixed a bridge uh, over a small creek. And the neighbors got to know us because we're the guys that did this. So all of us were out there, me included, picking up trash or doing whatever, so that we would be part of the community. So in a way, that's your defense. Hmm. At the end of your time in Afghanistan, what did you feel like you had accomplished? A great deal. It was amazing to see how much people listened to the radio. We, we did a, a, a program on uh, homosexuality. In Afghanistan? In Afghanistan. We got more comments and praise for that program than any other broadcast we did. People expected us to talk about controversial issues. Hmm. And research, we did audience research at one point, and that program was talked about a lot as being something that they really liked. They wanted to hear about it. Wow. Let's go to Sudan, or should I say to 98.6? <laughs> 98.6 SRS FM. Yeah. When you put on a radio station anywhere in the world, you got to get your frequency in there somewhere <laughs> to get them to do it. And uh, in the United States, you can't get a frequency of 98.6. And I've always wanted it <laughs> because you have to have an odd number in the U.S. So why did you go to Sudan? Uh, it was an exciting project. I heard about it when I was in Afghanistan. Somebody had gone out and done uh, some preliminary research on whether a project would work or not. And uh, the U.S. government decided it was worth doing. So it started up. And it ran for about six years before I got there. The guy that was there for those six years, um, he, we could finally get back into Sudan, into Sudan at the time. It's now South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, and he didn't want to go because he was married and his family was living in Nairobi. And he didn't want to have to move them to Juba. In fact, it, Juba is an unaccompanied post, what the US government calls an unaccompanied post. You can't bring your family with you because uh, it's too dangerous. Okay. And there's not schools and there's no infrastructure. So it was difficult for, uh, for him. So he decided that it was time for him to leave and then I came in and took over. Since I was single, it was easy. Hmm. Um, with regard to Sudan itself, the, it was, you were not working for the US government. They were just, they were funding a contractor, right? Right. And then you worked for the contractor. Right. So it, it, you, were you ever representing the US government? No. No, and we tried as much as we could to be independent. The only concession I made is uh, on the front gate, I put the USAID logo on the mm -hmm. front gate, thinking that if somebody wanted to do a hostile takeover, because what happens in a military coup, you take over the radio station, oh, okay. right? So I was hoping that would slow them down, maybe enough for my staff to sneak out the back door. <laughs> uh, but I, we tried to keep ourselves distant. And USAID has always been wonderful, well, not always, but most of the time is wonderful about re recognizing our independence. So what was your approach there? What were you trying to do? I mean, it sounds fascinating to be able to go and start a radio station in not just a country, but a brand new country, South Sudan. 
Right, and it was there for independence too, uh, uh -huh. for when they became independent. Um, the goal there was to get, create something that the Sudanese, South Sudanese could take over themselves. So the goal from day one was to have it run by the South Sudanese. So it meant training, you know, creating a middle management, creating a manager. I left the place with the general manager. I, uh, I gave you a photo of him. His name is Stephen O'Meary. And he's amazing. He was uh, uh, recruited as, at nine years old as a child soldier, was uh -huh. rose to the level of captain in the South Sudan Liberation Army. And he uh, was hired originally by the project in, when we were in Kenya and broadcasting on shortwave. And he went to night school and got an MBA. So wow. I left the radio station in good hands. And he uh, is brilliant. He's doing a fantastic job. That's what I wanted. And it took me about four years, four and a half years, to get the radio station to the point where it could start to be on that path of running itself. One thing is for sure, though, whether it's Afghanistan or Croatia, those are very poor places. South Sudan probably is poorer than any of them. Yeah. There's How could they afford a radio station? Well, the trick was the radio station itself, the equipment, the transmitter, the tape recorders, the cars, the building, was all paid for by the U.S. government. So now their trick is to pay for the diesel fuel for the generators. So that lowers their expenses. Here in the United States, you have to, you have to pay for all your equipment and any replacement that mm -hmm. comes up. So that was covered. So that makes your nut a little smaller, mm -hmm. maybe? Now, as you were in, as you're seeing this new country, you know, unfold, I mean, some, oh. one of these days they may talk about you as the Ben Franklin of, of uh, I hope not. Of South Sudan. <laughs> yeah. um, the, my, my question, though, is who wanted the radio station? Was it just the outsiders or was it the locals? The locals. There was, during the war, uh, the Civil War with the South versus the North, there was an underground uh, radio. Mm -hmm. and one of my staff was the voice, one of the voices, and her voice was recognized uh, as being one of those that was on the radio at that time. So they liked it. They liked to hear what's going on. They're just curious about what's happening, especially what's happening in other parts of the country, uh, instead of just their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, and that continues. They're hungry for news. They'll just eat it up. So then the station was, was news 24-7? No, also we had a lot of music. Uh, when we were on shortwave, we couldn't, music doesn't do well on shortwave, but we still did music programs. Uh, but we, shortwave broadcasting is very, very expensive. I forgot how much it is per hour, but it's mm -hmm. very expensive. So we were limited to a few hours in the morning and a few hours in every evening. When we got a 24-hour station, first trick was to teach my staff what time was. Because with, with the shortwave, we had a 5 o'clock in the evening deadline. They had to have all their programs done, and we had to upload the stuff on the internet to London, who then put it on uh, shortwave transmitters, and it would go out. Okay. But then, it, and we would also upload the morning show at, starting at 5 o'clock in the evening. So they had one deadline. Well, now with a 24-hour station, you've got several deadlines a day. Mm -hmm. So how do you get your staff to do that? And how do you get them to start the 12 o'clock news at exactly 12 000, 000, 000? As a broadcaster, what? you know what that's like. <laughs> yeah, so, you... so we had to kind of teach them how to do that. And advertisers, like Coca-Cola is an advertiser that you'll get right away. Uh, but they won't pay you if you don't broadcast the commercial on the time that they said. So if you're a minute late with their commercial, they won't pay you for it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we sitting here in America, it's kind of easy for us to say, well, you know, it's just you just watch the clock and then you punch the button. Right. But I've been to Africa, <laughs> and African time is different. It's very different. We also have put in the first weather station. We had to teach them what the temperature was. Oh. Uh, so, because we would broadcast weather information for the farmers. Uh, so we, there's a lot of learning that yeah, had to go but on. But right now, immediately, I'm thinking of Robin Williams, uh, you know, in Good Morning Good. Vietnam, and, and he's talking about the weather. You know, just look outside, and it's hot, and then he goes on. Right. Well, but it, like, do you know what trans evaporation is? I have no idea. It's how much water is being evaporated out of the ground. If you're a farmer, that's really important. You want to know how much water you're losing and how much water you're gaining when it rains. So we started teaching people on the air about that. We did other things, and it's also even simpler. Wash your hands now. 
Literally, we would broadcast that frequently through the day. Wash your hands now. Really? Yeah, think of the Ebola crisis right now. Yeah, for sure. In, in South Sudan, and South Sudan was becoming a country, and you've got the radio station, were the, the various sides wanting to you, you, use you politically? <laughs> shock them all, shock. Uh, more that they wanted to re make sure that we weren't being used by anyone else. Oh. <laughs> uh, we had lots of difficulties. Uh, the government sometimes would come by and accuse us of broadcasting something they didn't like. Whose government? Uh, the South Sudanese government. Oh, okay. uh, sometimes the state government would, uh, would react to something, and then it turns out we didn't broadcast what they were offended by. Some other station did, but they just got confused about which one it was. Uh, the Catholic radio station in Juba, South Sudan, they actually shut the station off and uh, took the nun that was in charge and put her in jail for a while, accusing them of broadcasting things that were against the government. And it turned out that they didn't broadcast those things. It was somebody else. What if you had? Pardon? What if you had broadcast those things that were against the government? Would that have put you in jail? Possibly. Possibly. Is what you were trying to teach, what you were trying to be independent, were you trying to get an ethic or an ethos inside of them that they yes. are independent and they should have free media? Yes. Isn't that yours? Isn't that the American point of view and not necessarily the South Sudanese point of view? No, the South Sudanese, actually anywhere in the world, seriously, they know propaganda when they hear it. In Croatia, they had a state-run television. Um, and there was uh, just a really quick story. There was a joke about that they had three channels, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and channel one would be a rebroadcast of whatever the Pope did last on his visit. Channel two would be whatever the president of the country did with the Pope. And channel three would be a police officer saying, switch to channel two. <laughs> um, anyway, the, they know the propaganda, and they can see through it. We have less than a minute left. I've got to ask you, um, are you helping to change the world through what you're doing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I want to do. And it really makes a difference. What I like is when you find a young man who's upset with something going on in his government, and he comes into your radio station and says, I want to do you to do a story about this or that. And say, well, you know, we don't necessarily have ax grinding hour going on here. Why don't you run for office? And then you could do something about it. And he did. Wow. And he's one of the people that's trying to get peace and reform going on. It's great. Well, with that, John, thank you very much for being here. Thank us. you, Stan.